This talk will focus on the greater sandhill cranes of Modoc County, California. All the photos and text are by Loris Phillips. Hi, my name is Loris Phillips and I'm excited to share with you some photos and stories of these amazing birds. Um, first, a disclaimer though, I'm an artist, I'm not a biologist. And in fact, I have a show right now at the Open Space Visitor Center in Albuquerque through the end of December. Um, I'm a lifelong birder and I've um, been volunteering at the Modoc National Wildlife Refuge in Alturas, California. Uh, I'll be showing you fun family photos of the cranes from there and also uh, presenting on the banding program they have there. I first started going there in 2016 to take photographs to paint the cranes from. Uh, the staff then asked me if I saw a crane with a band on its leg, would I please take note of the number on that band? So I soon got hooked. Um, this data collection is for a program that was started by Dr. Gary Ivey in 1986, and it monitors the crane cults that are hatched there. Um, so I started going there in, um, like I said, 2016. So I've been going about five years and I, I try to go for a week every month while the cranes are there between uh, February and September um, this year because of COVID, only two weeks. So, but I wanna thank the staff um, of the Modoc National Wildlife Refuge for all their help and also to thank uh, Jessie Simons, she's the biologist there for all her help in this um, putting on this presentation. So please enjoy and uh, take care. The Modoc National Wildlife Refuge is in the high desert of Northeast California near the town of Alturas. It's in a basin that's mostly agricultural. The refuge is managed for greater sandhills and waterfowl of all kinds. In this photo, you can see the Pitt River as it widens in the refuge and becomes wetland. Water is controlled by a system of gates and channels, and in the summer, it's channeled in from Doris Reservoir that's visible in the top right of this photo. On this map, you can see Doris Reservoir again in the top right and the numerous management blocks that make up the refuge. I use this map as a reference when collecting band data, since I need to locate and record where I'm seeing each bird. I take photos of the banded birds and later expand them on my computer so I can read the band numbers. I then record the data on a sheet like the one on the right. I also record nests and scout for colts to band in the summertime. And then when it's time to band, I help with that too and I take pictures. The cranes begin to arrive from the Central Valley of California around Valentine's Day in mid-February. It's often still really cold and snowy then. There are two subspecies of sandhill crane that use the Modoc Refuge, greater and lesser sandhill cranes. The refuge is considered part of the Pacific Flyway, and most of the cranes we see in the early spring are migrating. They rest and eat and move on. That's called staging, and fields like this provide a perfect place to stage on the way to wherever they'll spend their spring and summer. They stage on the return trip in the fall as well. Notice the size difference in this photo. The lessers are walking in front of the graders, and you can see how small they seem. They're lighter weight and they migrate as far as Alaska. For the cranes of Modoc, migration is relatively short. In all, about 55,000 cranes use the Pacific Flyway, which includes the route through Modoc. Of those 55,000, 40,000 are lessers, 8 to 12,000 are graders, and the other 6,000 are of an intermediate size called Canadians, and they migrate to the west coast of Canada. They're not yet considered a subspecies. 30 to 40 pairs of the greater sandhills stay to nest on the refuge every year. Many of these were hatched there and have been returning for years with their relatives.
So much of what I know about Greater Sand Hill Cranes in California, I've learned from Dr. Gary Ivey, who started the banding program at Modoc National Wildlife Refuge in 1986. This map is from him. Thank you, Gary. Gary has done nest surveys throughout the region and was biologist at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Eastern Oregon from 1983 to 1998. He now works for the, for the International Crane Foundation and his focus is on the preservation of wintering habitat for cranes in the Central Valley of California. You can see that there is a green area in California, Oregon and Washington where a distinct population of greater sandhill cranes nest. That includes the cranes of Modoc County. This population was eaten by humans to near extinction. By the 1940s, there were five pairs left nesting in California. There was also tremendous pressure on their habitat by certain farming practices, as there is today. Thankfully, through the National Wildlife Refuge system, some of their nesting habitat has been restored and is maintained. Thanks to the Migratory Bird Treaty of 1916, commercial hunting of cranes was stopped, and thanks to the California Endangered Species Act, they were listed as threatened in the state in 1983. At this time, they're still considered a threatened population of cranes, but their numbers are rising. Probably the biggest threat is on the wintering grounds where urban sprawl and the conversion of grain fields to vineyards have eliminated traditional roosting and foraging areas. Dr. Gary Ivey has written extensively on this if you want more information. Cranes return on migration with their relatives, and in the case of pairs that have long-term relationships, they usually return to their historic nesting territories. If they were lucky enough to rear a cult to flight stage and then teach that cult the migration route both south and back north again, the juvenile cult will return to the nesting territory with their parents. You can see the difference in the plumage in this first year bird. It has red on its head, but it is a darker gray and has gold edges on its wing feathers. When the parents begin to get serious about nesting again, the juvenile is kicked out to join a bachelor group for the spring and the summer. In these large migrating flocks, there's lots of action, like this courtship dancing. You can see this dancing in the flocks and also on nesting territories throughout the spring. It takes a few years before cranes mature enough to commit. By consulting the banding data, we know that the dancing bird in this photo with a band on its leg is three years old. And the bird in the photo that's not dancing but also has a band was two years old at the time of this photo. The two-year-old watched these dancers with rapt attention for like 20 minutes. Here's another dance posture along with an ink painting I made from the photo called Flirt. There's also a lot of competitive fighting during migration. Sometimes it looks ritualized like this, and sometimes there's real contact and aggression. I've often seen feathers flying, and in one fight I saw a crane immobilized another by grabbing its opponent's upper wing in its bill and then pinning its neck to the ground with its foot. In March, it's still really cold in the high desert at night. So on very cold mornings, I've seen cranes keep their landing gear up on short flights until just before landing, as in this photo when it was 16 degrees. Sometimes they wake and have to break out of the ice that's covering the pond they slept in. Can you see the ring of ice on that crane's leg? I imagine that it's a safe roosting strategy. If a predator came in the night, the sound of the ice breaking would alert the cranes. They often roost in a shallow pond like this one or on an island for safety. Have you ever seen a crane's foot? Cranes can't perch in trees. Their feet have three front toes and a vestigial hind toe that can't wrap around a branch like a heron's foot can. By early April, the non-residents have mostly moved through. Maybe you've seen the lean when one bird is trying to convince its cohorts that it's time to go. They all eventually lean before running and then flying. This is a Japanese ink painting I did of that posture called the lean.
Greater Sandhill cranes have nearly a seven foot wingspan and they use the afternoon thermals for lift, spiraling up and up until they're out of sight and on their way. There's a lot of noisy calling in the spring too. This could be two pairs sorting out their territorial boundary. One pair's territory can be several acres and needs to include both a nesting site and good foraging for the future family. I've seen mating as early as March 14th and as late as May 1st. It usually occurs in the early morning on the nesting territory and the sequence of movements is really lovely. Mates make this unison call at dawn on their nesting territory and repeatedly throughout the day. Often pairs in adjacent territories answer back and the calls resound around the wetland. Take a good look at these postures. It's one of the only times you can know for sure the gender of a crane. The male arches his neck and calls with his bill nearly straight up, whereas the female uses a lower angle and a higher voice. Defensive behaviors can look a lot like courtship, but the alarm call is really distinctive and the vigor with which they try to scare an intruder away is really intense. In this case, I'm the intruder and I'm trying to get a photograph of that band on that crane's leg. And the crane was jumping up and down and grabbing big clumps of grass and throwing it in the air. Feather staining is really common. Cranes pick up muddy bits of vegetation and smear it around in their feathers everywhere they can reach. They really crane their necks to do it. There are theories about feather staining, which you may have heard. It could be for camouflage while nesting, or it could be for feather mites, or, or what do you think? Another thing to notice here are the feathers that bustle up over the rump of the crane in the left-hand photo. Sometimes people mistake these for tail feathers. Here are a couple of those bustle feathers. They're naturally curved and are found on the wing close to the body. You can see them on the wing of the bird on the right hand photo. You can also get a peek at the real tail. It's really a simple fan shaped tail with a lot of fluff underneath. By the end of the summer, some cranes have stained themselves quite brown. This pair forage daily in the field next to the refuge bunkhouse where I stay when I'm there, and I think this dark stain is related to the soil on that territory. Nest building happens in March and April, and it can look kind of haphazard because it's done by tossing rushes or tulies over the back until a big pile is made. Here's a classic nest on the edge of a pond. Cranes share the incubation of the egg. Males and females both sit on the nest. And that incubation is 29 to 32 days. This nest was just a few scraps on a bare island. This style may be the work of inexperienced parents and it did not succeed, but it did inspire my Japanese ink painting called The Egg. Here's another on the edge of a pond. Ideally nests like this float with the rising water of spring snow melt so they don't get flooded. There are so many beautiful crane behaviors to witness at the Modoc National Wildlife Refuge, but one of the most wonderful I call the changing of the sitters. 
The parents take turns on the nest. One sits while the other forages. Usually they'll call to each other as the incoming crane arrives. In this photo, you can see that the incoming crane is the male by the verticality of its bill as he calls. Sometimes the two circle around the nest together and then the outgoing mate leaves for a turn at foraging. The incoming mate might then arrange some nest material or roll the eggs over and then carefully step behind the eggs, fold up, and gently sit down with its breast over the eggs. This nest is really well hidden. Can you find it? The refuge does a really wonderful job of creating and maintaining nest sites like this. Sometimes I'll watch a nest for a very long time before the sitter stands to roll the eggs or to exchange responsibilities on the nest. It's then that I try to get a photo of a band on a leg. Once they sit back down, they might sit for hours before standing again. In this case, there was no band to record, but we did put the nest with two eggs on our nest map for future reference. If a crane has its head down, they're really hard to see, so I have to search for a red spot between the two leaves. Can you see this crane's eye? Incubation is 29 to 32 days. That's a lot of days and nights protecting a very tasty egg. By early June, the colts start to hatch and it seems like there's new colts everywhere. Many families have two, but within the first month, there's often the loss of at least one. Crane colts are precocial, which means they're up and following the parents right away. I saw this family return to the nest two evenings in a row. I don't know if they roosted there, but they were there until dark adding vegetation to the nest. It looks to me like it may have suffered from rising water, but I was really happy to see this cult survived. I added this photo because it's just so cute. Colts are on the ground and vulnerable for 10 weeks from when they hatch until they can fly. And obviously roads are a hazard. Neither of the colts from this family survived and we're not sure why. It could have been a predator or it could have been the proximity of the territory to this road. One evening, this newly hatched cult was stuck on the wrong side of a defunct railroad track that runs through the refuge. You can see the cattails on the pond on the opposite side. Both its parents were frantic. They wanted their colt on the pond side, away from the busy road I was on. I called the refuge manager and he told me to help them out. So I scooped up the colt and carried it to the other side while the parents made a racket. Parents need to protect their young from predators, and if discovered with a colt, they'll sometimes pretend to have a broken wing and try to coax an intruder away. I was driving by on a survey and never saw the colt when I was distracted by this behavior. I guess it works. Here's another protective behavior. Cranes have to defend territories from other cranes that might move in on resources or even steal a colt. I saw a pair with three colts recently, which may have been the result of such a kidnapping. Their diet is really varied. 
Notice the size of this bill. It's a digging tool. They dig in the mud for roots and worms. The Great Basin Wild Rye on the refuge is an important food also, as are any rodents they excavate out of burrows like this vole. Colts can fly at 10 weeks old, so we have a brief window at 7 to 9 weeks when we can ban them. This can be in July or August, depending on when the colt was hatched. The colts need to be big enough that the bands won't slide over their tarsal joints, but still young enough that they can't fly. Jesse Simons is the refuge biologist, so she's the team leader. If I'm there, I like to scout out the colts to see where they are on the refuge in the early morning. Banding has to happen before summer temperatures hit 80, so we need to be efficient. If we're lucky to have a high school work crew on the refuge for the summer, they get recruited. We go out in a truck and get as close to the cult as possible by road. If the cult's visible, a spotter stays at a high point and guides the team by phone to where they last saw the cult. Meanwhile, the parents are trying to divert everyone and the cult is either lying motionless on the ground or is running through the deep grass away. The team spreads out and watches their feet because if a colt's on the ground, they're surprisingly camouflaged. The first person to it will put a hat over its head. Then the banders get to work, holding legs and passing tools until there are three colored plastic bands, a metal federal band, and a tall red numbered band on their legs. This is Jesse putting on the federal band. The numbered red band is two and three quarter inches long and is unique to all the cranes banded at this refuge, both in color and that it starts with a P. The band numbers are sequential with P001, the first, from 1986. This one, P400, was banded July 18th, 2019. We have special affection for this one because of that number. The colored bands are to back up the numbered bands in case the number is obscured over time. The federal metal band also has a number and it's registered with the National Bird Banding Lab. So far, there have been 403 crane colts banded at the Modoc Refuge over 34 summers. This program gives scientists information on where they go and if multiple members of a family get banded, they can learn a lot about family dynamics. Parents are really good at hiding their colts, and often we don't see a colt until it's too large to band. This one could fly in short hops by the time we found it, so it escaped our banding crew. P400 was on the small side when we banded it in July and didn't get flight feathers until mid-August. P400's father, P349, was banded in 2014. So he's five years old in this photo. And this is his first documented cult. We know he's a male because we saw him unison calling with his mate. By late summer, families are flying together from their territories for part of the day. They mix with other local cranes and migrants who are foraging in the grain fields on and adjacent to the refuge. Then when the evening comes, it's back to their nesting territories to roost. By mid-September, the colts are really big. They're as big as their parents, and they're ready to migrate. P400 was documented with his parents mixing with the migrant flock on the refuge on September 13th. The next record we have of it is from October 12th in the Central Valley of California at Llano Seco. Llano Seco is a northern unit of the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge. A dear friend of mine, Lori Thompson, took this picture at Llano Seco. Llano Seco is 146 miles in a straight line from the Modoc Refuge. If these cranes flew in a straight line, 
I imagine the trip could be made in one day. Several of the band reports from last winter were from an additional 88 miles south at the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. In fact, the oldest band number reported so far in 2020 was P196, and it was reported from the Stone Lakes last winter. It was banded in 2001, so that's a 19-year-old bird. It hasn't been seen on the Modoc Refuge since 2012, but it's wintered at Stone Lakes since at least 2005. P400 made it back to the refuge this spring. It was documented with its parents in March back on the territory where it was hatched and raised. Hopefully, we'll be able to follow this bird for many years to come and possibly ban the next generation of colts from this family. In the second week of March of this year, 2020, as the migrants were arriving and moving through, Jesse Simons, the biologist at the Modoc Refuge, and I recorded 53 of our banded birds. That's 53 out of the 403 banded over 34 years. Some were in the migrant flock of over a thousand, and some were already on their nesting territories. As it is rare to see any of the first 200, 53 is a really successful return. So anyone who's out crane watching can be a citizen scientist. Please record and report band numbers, crane band numbers with location and date to the National Bird Banding Lab at reportband.gov. And please don't forget that I have a show of my paintings right now at Open Space Visitor Center. It's in Albuquerque on Coors Boulevard until the end of December. It's open to the public Tuesday through Saturday, nine to five. All the paintings are from photos I took at the refuge and made with materials gathered there. I hope you can stop in and see it, but if you can't, there's a page on my website called Crane Music, and you can see all the art in the show there at lorisphillipsart.com. All the work is for sale, and you can inquire about that at the open space. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. If you have questions or comments, please contact me at loris at lorisphillipsart.com. Thanks. And thank you, Open Space, for this opportunity.